are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. I think having timing is um, timing is the hardest thing about riding, having good timing and seeing a distance. And I think that's what most um, people struggle with, because the really when you watch the really top riders, you don't see them doing anything. And you're like going, how are they accomplishing that? And you're trying to even when you're sitting with somebody, you're watching these riders just finding all the distances, yet it's invisible. Um, But it's it's all about learning to ride with pace and being patient and letting the distance come to you. Welcome to the Practical Horseman podcast, featuring conversations with respected riders, industry leaders, and horse care experts. The show is co-hosted by Practical Horseman editors, and our goal is to inform, educate, and inspire. I'm Sandy Olenek, and this week's episode is with 2023 National Show Hunter Hall of Fame inductee, Bill Schaub. Because Bill is such an accomplished hunter and equitation trainer, we talked a lot about riding and training, both horses and riders, during our conversation. He discusses his favorite exercise to help a rider develop feel, treating horses as individuals to bring out their best, a rider's timing and seeing distances to the jumps, competition ring tips, and how to keep competition nerves under control, plus a lot more. To give you some background on Bill, He's been a professional in the industry for nearly 50 years and trained some of the country's top pony, junior, and amateur riders and their horses. He was inducted into the National Show Hunter Hall of Fame in May of 2023. His horses and students have earned more than 50 championships and reserve championship titles at prestigious shows such as the Devon Horse Show and the East Coast Fall Indoor Circuit. Top students have included Ashley and Courtney Kennedy, Liza Towell Boyd, Lauren Bass, Evan Coluccio, and Taylor St. Jacques. He's based at his over-the-hill farm in Wellington, Florida, and Lexington, Kentucky. Before getting into the discussion, I want to thank this week's sponsor, U.S. Rider, and share their message. Whether you and your horse are headed across the country or just down the road, the new U.S. Rider app helps you be prepared. From free traveling planning, checklists, travel document storage, health alerts, emergency vet and farrier referrals, and more, you'll find everything you need to stay organized and have a safe trip at your fingertips. Plus, U.S. Rider members can easily request roadside assistance within the app. Ready to make traveling with your horse easier? Download the new U.S. Rider app from the Apple and Google Play app stores today. Now, let's jump right into the discussion with Bill, where he starts with how a rider develops feel. Coming, you know, kind of becoming in one with your horse, you know, getting to where you, you know, it takes practice. I mean, you've got to dedicate yourself if you want to become an accomplished rider. And there's no shortcuts for experience. Um, there's an article I read once about being accomplished to become accomplished at anything. It requires 10,000 hours. And when you think about how many hours 10,000 hours is, um, that's a lot of hours. They say to become accomplished at just about anything you have to devote 10,000 hours to it. And I don't think people know that getting in sometimes. They just think, you know, you buy a horse and you learn to ride and horse does all of it. But what you have to understand is you're communicating that horse, telling them what to do. And so you've got to develop the feel of what's going on underneath you. And that comes from repetition and doing things again and again and again. And in the meantime, you've got to preserve horses. So that even complicates that you're dealing with a living creature that if you over practice, you can break them down. So you've got to think of ways to develop feel and not overuse your horse. Mm -hmm. And um, do you have this is a question I was going to ask a little bit later, but do you have like a, a favorite exercise for developing feel or is there any training hints you could give people who are working on that? Well, I, I think rails on the ground. I mean, I, you can jump thousands of rails on the ground with a horse and not break them down, where you're limited how many jumps you can jump without breaking them down. So we do a lot of rail work. I teach my riders, you know, to timing and feel just going over rails on the ground and putting, you know, rails all over the ring and doing so many strides between these rails and then adding a stride and then leaving a stride out. and in the meantime, it's developing your, not only your feel, but your timing. And timing is very important in riding. 
Yeah. And how um, this is, you know, I have to admit, going over rails on the ground was always my my nemesis. When you're teaching people to go over rails on the ground, where are you having them look? Like, are you having them look um, at the rail until they see a distance or how what's your approach with those? My approach is to you look at the rail and when you see where you're at, you look beyond and you look up and you feel you feel it. You know, you've got to you got to look at the rail to judge your distance. But you're basically developing an eye for a distance. And right. um, so we'll we'll do collected work and we'll do extended work and we'll do medium work over different rails on the ground. Cavalettis, simple exercises like that. And I like you to look at the rail. But then it's when you feel where you're at, then you look beyond and you look up. Great, great, super. Um, well, a little bit along the same lines, I guess, just in general, what do you think makes a good horseman? Well, a good horseman, in my eyes, is being able, taking care of your animal, knowing that it is an athlete and that you're an athlete and that you've got to take care of the animal with proper nutrition, proper turnout, proper grooming proper vet work, proper blacksmith, and just basic proper care. And knowing your horse well enough to know exactly how much it takes to get it ready for the ring, to prepare for the ring, and not overdo so that you can be competitive. We, know, we all know horses need preparation, and whether that's a lunge or a ride in the morning or both, um, you've got to figure out what it takes to get your horse ready for that competition. And depending on how tough the competition is, we don't always prepare our horses for a small, light horse show the same way we would for, say, the National Horse Show. Um, they don't have to go at the National Horse. They don't have to go at a smaller show like they have to go at the National Horse Show. So when the competition is stronger, it's going to take a little more prep. It's going to take a little more organization than it would at a lighter show. And that way I can sparingly use my horses as much as they need to be used to com compete where we're at at the present time. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and getting into your horses, I was, uh, it was kind of like a little walk down memory lane, you know, looking at some of your, your famous horses. Um, I guess, you know, just going back to the, the 1980s and 90s, um, one of your famous horses was Lyric, and um, she had been a former field hunter. And I read uh, that you had when I think sort of shortly after you saw her, when you saw her, you you knew she'd be a star. So I was just wondering what made you think that? Well, I had a rider that had good timing, but was very soft and still and didn't like to use a lot of leg, which was Ashley Kennedy at the time. And she could use her leg, but she liked to, she had great timing, which, and she rode very still. And that mare had a natural cadence and a boldness that I thought really attributed, attributed to the success they had together. And Ashley was a great one to ride a horse like that. So it was the combination that I think is so important with what we're doing. Yeah, I like that how how you were, you know, you're sort of talking about matching the horse with the rider and and it might be a basic question, but why do you think that's so important? Well, I think that you know all riders are different, and they have different um natural basic your your personality is part of your riding. If you're an aggressive strong personality, you tend to be an aggressive strong rider. I mean, that's not always the case, but it's very similar. If you're more of a passive, quiet type person, you tend to be a more passive, quiet rider. And so I think that you've got to get to know your riders and know your horses. And at least in the beginning stages, as riders get more accomplished, they learn to ride more different types. And with Lyric, um do you have any training insights that helped to make her as successful as she was? Well, she could get really heavy in the mouth. So we did a lot of um, flat work, you know, teaching her short and her stride and getting her mouth light. I did a lot of flat work with her, um, a lot of gymnastics to get um, her to hold her jump and pause in the air a little bit because she tended to be natural have a natural gallop that was bold. So we did a lot of shortening exercises. Of course, you have to lengthen and then shorten and teach the horse to be adjustable. And that was the big thing about her is getting her adjustable and lighten the bridle so you could negotiate the course smoothly. 
Mm-hmm. So that's when you say flat work. It was it was transitions from from lengthening to shortening collection. Absolutely, lots of rails in the ground as well to get her to um, um, cavalettis to get her to pause and take slow steps and then cantering the rails on the ground and making her collect to them and then maybe galloping the one and then making her shorten so that if you found the so you found the single oxer at the gallop you'd be able to shorten her at the ends of the ring bending exercises so that you know she gets supple through the corners you know it's basically what i my approach with basically all horses you know they've got to they've got to adjust their stride their mouth has to be responsive they have to be responsive to your aids so that as you see a distance, they react to what you see so that you can make smooth adjustments and be competitive. Right. Um, and it sounds like on the flat, you you can get a lot of you. You can and should accomplish a lot of that work, the adjustability and um, and getting them. So and when you said soft in the mouth, is that what does does doing the transitions as you talked about? Does that help soften them? Absolutely. Absolutely. Teaching them to as you steady and use their mouth, they respond and they come back to you and they shape through the ends of the ring. So you can be shaped through the the ends of the ring, Um, whether you're doing the equitation or great hunter rounds, you know, the ends of the rings are very important. I mean, even with jumpers, it's all about them being responsive and listening to you. Yeah, It's, it's much more similar than people even realize. Yeah, and I like what you're talking about, the ends of the ring. Kind of, that can be a forgotten place, but it is a, a, a really important part of your course. And when you're judging, that's really important. That's where you've got to get your homework done, and yet you've got to be smooth about it. So when the judge looks up, that you're being smooth, but you're also getting your horse prepared for the next line or the next obstacle or the next combination or whatever it is you're approaching. Great, great. Um, another horse uh, was Mind Games, and um, I read that you had figured out uh, ways to make Mind Games, you know, who was a hot and quirky horse, happy. So I guess, how did you figure out out that? Well, I had the benefit of, um, you know, Tommy Ciro had started that horse as a young horse. So first thing I do is I don't try to reinvent the wheel. I go to the people that had success or had um, you had the opportunity to train or ride the horse before and i see what they learned and that was a he was you know a thoroughbred horse that was very hot and um didn't didn't like you to use his mouth so you opposite approach we didn't use his mouth a lot um you had to do a kind of a pull and give type release with him to get him to soften and then you had to let it go so a lot of it was about being still and that horse, I don't know how you do it nowadays, but he barely ever even cantered on a daily basis. He mostly trotted and walked, trotted small jumps. When we um, showed him, we never even cantered a fence before we went in the ring. We just trotted jumps to get him to be um, pause, jump the jump, make a nice effort. And then the, the jump, he learned that the jump is what held him. Hmm. Okay. And that that sounds kind of probably like it would be nerve wracking for some people to. Yes, to some people it was they, that was a very difficult horse to ride because most people, if they wanted to slow down, um, you know, they they'd want to pull too much on the reins. And if you pull too hard, he'd lock in like a thoroughbred and he'd run away with you. So you mm-hmm. had to be able to pull and then soften, pull and then soften. Wow. And then a couple of things I read that that I think you had done was. Um, you put a bell on his neck in the stall to kind of calm him down. His mother was blind. And so oh, he wore a bell as a, as a baby so that his mother could find him. So it was very odd. He would get very neurotic in the stall at times and stuff. And um, you had, we had a, um, a string with a bell on it. And if you put that bell on his neck, it calmed him down. It was the strangest thing I'd ever seen, but it really did work. And it, you know, it um, was just something that knowing about how he he came up through the years and um, what they'd done in the past really benefited that. And knowing that his mother was blind and he wore, wore a bell, bell when he was a colt, it, it, that was how I figured that out. 
Yeah. And I, what I love about that is, is, um, and I think you'd said it before, you know, um, treating a horse as an individual and definitely thinking outside the box. Absolutely. Tommy had taught me a trick that um, right before we went in the ring, sometimes we'd get a wad of grass if he's exceptionally heavy or in the mouth and you'd stick a wad of grass in his mouth and then you'd tighten the nose span and he'd suck on that wad of grass um, as he went around the ring. And then you uh-huh. just nose band when he came out and then eat a little bit of grass. Wow. And that just calmed him down? Or? And it just it calmed him down and it made him lighter in the mouth. Well, uh, you know, how about um, some other important horses, you know, throughout your career? Um, can you, any, anyone else stand out? Well, you know, um, in, the, in the most recent years, you know, we've had uh, um, different, you know, different horses that we've had. But like the, the mare that um, has won the junior hunter finals the past um three years in fact arabesque is a, a horse that steve and i got as a young horse and brought it along we sold it props and that mare just had her certain likes and dislikes and you had to do a lot of counter cantering to build her she was a little one-sided so in the beginning we had to do a lot of counter cantering to get her more even on one side than the other teaching her to land both leads getting her light in the bridle her lead change in the beginning was not natural. It was there, but it wasn't necessarily a natural thing. So we had to be very patient with that. And it was a great opportunity when we were able to sell her to the props. And the prop girl um, had, had another year in the 3-3. Three, three. So that mare was just started the first year when we sold her. So she had the uh, advantage of having another year in the 3-3 three, three juniors before she moved on to the juniors. That was the only reason I didn't buy her at the time for Sterling Malnick, is she was already doing the three six. Mm. And so when we sold it to the props, it was the perfect situation because it um the Brian Gutal and her team did a great job finishing the horse before she had to move into the junior hunters. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's the whole thing is getting the horse as you buy and sell horses, putting them in the right place. Um, I had a um, season this year where I had to sell some horses and I was very lucky because I sat down and had some top junior hunters that were coming on the market and I really wanted them to go on and be successful. So, you know, I first sat down and made a list of the people that needed horses. And then I thought about the trainers that would, you know, listen to the recipe and the riders that would suit them. And I approached them individually from my list in the order of Mm. my particular preference. And I actually really got lucky and placed all the horses got placed in areas that they're being successful. And that really is gratifying when you've had horses, you know, some of these horses I've had two, three, four years in my stable and you, they were going to go on to another stable and to see them go on and still do well is very important after all, all the time you've spent with them and of course you also want to have happy clients they'll come back one day and buy another horse from you yeah yeah i like i i like how your I like, your approach just sounds really um horse centric too you know that that trying to think of what's best for them or what's going to make a good fit well because no one's you know it's hard enough to make this all work you know we all uh, matching horses and riders is very difficult and understanding the horses and they all what we have to realize is they're all very different they all have a different program that's going to make them be the very best they can that horse might need a 10 minute lunge so it loosens up and just feels relaxed and then go out for a hand walk other horses need really heavy duty flat work in the morning some horses need to get in the ring some perform better if they don't get in the ring and see the job so i think you've got to really know what works best for them um we had a very successful junior hunter um with sterling malnick recently called coronation and he for some reason on the right lead you could see the distances for miles back, but on the left lead, he Tanner was a little different. And st- as Steve and I worked with him, he realized the better he, the more flat work he did, and the better he got his mouth on the left lead, the better it showed a distance. And so that was the secret to him, just getting his left lead as good as his right lead. And that came down to flat work and getting him light on that left side. He'd get very stiff on his left side, 
it would make it difficult to see the distance. So if you get them light on the left side, then all of a sudden the distance would appear. Yeah, I, I love that. I love how you're you're so able to figure out what the horse needs. Um, and that takes you know. time, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Knowing the individual horse and knowing what makes them tick um, is very important. I mean, I, I think that's I think to me, that's the real challenge. Right, right. I think I read um, that you advise, you know, all of your riders to get to know their horses on a personal level and treat them as individuals. And it sounds like kind of what you're what you've been talking about is is just that. I don't, I don't know if there's anything else that you, you know, for your riders to get to know their horses. Um, well, I, I like I, I like when they spend some time with them and get to know just um, what it requires to get them to the ring that they have some understanding. Um, I had one girl that would, um, she'd add strides out of the turn. And then of course she'd have to kick up the line. Then her horse would get strong. And I'd explain to her that, you know, you've got to understand everything you do when you're preparing for the ring is your training, no matter whether you're training right or wrong, you're still a trainer, you're training. Every ride is a training session. So if you don't, um, learn to find the distances out of the turn out of the gallop so then the lines get easy that horse is going to continue to get strong with you on the landing side of the um out of the line because you're always mm-hmm. kicking up the line and so um years ago um joey darby had taught me that the secret was making the last stride before the fence the slowest stride so the horse could balance sit back on his hops and jump a better jump and then land quietly on the other side. So in order to do that, you can't pull out of the turn and fit in extra strides or you're going to make the out of the line long. So you have to learn to gallop and then make the last few strides a little slower so that the horse then balances, makes its best jump and then lands quietly on the other side of the, the obstacle. Um, Same thing done with the jumpers in order them to um, jump a clean jump you'll watch those top riders they're they're galloping as fast as they can but you'll see them sitting away and then balancing that last couple strides if they possibly can to make it a little slower and you'll see that just the least little bit of slowdown so that horse can be balanced to make a better effort Nice. Now, how, you know, since you do teach amateurs and juniors and um, how do you you know, I know, um, I shouldn't say, speaking for myself, I know as an amateur rider, I was always nervous about seeing a distance and galloping out of the corner. And it, that took a bit of work. How do you, I guess, do you have that problem with your students? And how do you? I think having timing is, um, timing is the hardest thing about riding, having good timing and seeing a distance. And I think that's what most um people struggle with because the really when you watch the really top riders you don't see them doing anything and you're like going how are they accomplishing that and you're trying to even when you're sitting with somebody you're watching these riders just finding all the distances yet it's invisible um but it's it's all about learning to ride with pace and being patient and letting the distance come to you and there are times that you're going to miss and you're going to make a mistake and you just have to live with that but the better, the more you perfect it, the more the, ho- the horse is responsive and the horse itself goes better because you're getting it to places that it's comfortable from. And I think that's the secret. Um, first, we just have to learn basic timing. You can't complicate this. As you get more advanced, you can worry about more of that. But I think the whole, the whole thing is being able to ride with pace and knowing that as a horse turns, they naturally slow down. So if the turn is sharper somewhere, you might have to add a little more leg. If it's a long gallop with a single oxer, knowing your horse, does he pick up to the long gallop? Does he back up from the long gallop and drop behind your leg? And preparing for that, that obstacle way out, knowing where your horse is best from. Mm-hmm. And then you'll learn that it shows you the distance that you're looking for. Yeah. Would you say, you know, a problem that that amateurs have um, is going too slow 
or not have I, enough pace? I think most people go too slow and need to start with more pace. And a, a lot of people like to go slow to the first jump. I always tell my riders, I go the courtesy circle. When you walk in the ring, in the schooling area, you want to get your horse responsive. But when you walk in the ring and you pick up a trot and then you pick up a canner, I like to have a time where in that gallop that I've lengthened my stride a little bit and asked my horse to go forward. And then a time where I slow my horse down a little bit and ask it to settle down. So as I'm approaching that first jump, I know that it's responsive and ready to react to what I see. And then you pick up a nice medium gallop. I always say medium is the best gait because medium, you can, you have so many options. You can slow down from a medium gallop. You can lengthen from a medium gallop, or you can say the same. If you're going too fast, you can only stay fast or slow down. If you're going too slow, you can only stay slow or speed up. So you're taking away one of your options. If you're going from a medium pace, a medium gallop, it gives you three different options. Mm, very neat. Um, you know, for people who might be working, you know, with a limited, limited training, um, how would you, and this might be getting too much into the weeds, but how would you describe the medium pace or how do you know that you've, you've got a medium pace? Yeah, well, you, you learn your horse, you learn your horse on what, you know, basically we start out, you know, if you're at three foot, most of them are set on like the 12 foot strad. So, and as the jumps get bigger, of course, they're going to lengthen the lines out, but you've got to figure out from the height you're jumping, what type of pace will carry your horse up the line without major moves. So that if you don't, because you're going to not meet every jump out of the corner the same. I mean, that's the first thing you've got to realize. You're not going to meet every distance the same, and you're not going to meet it the same each time you approach it. You can ride a turn three or four times, and it can ride a little differently from the track you're on. So you've got to develop the pace from practicing at home and being going to horse shows. What pace you feel when you jump in, that pace will carry you up the line and smoothly and get you to the out in the right place. So that's what you've got to, you've got to get that feel of pace. And I think that's what's hard to develop. And that's where the rails and the ground and doing shortening and lengthening exercises is where you develop your, your feel of pace. Mm, that's great. Um, if you go too fast, it's going to show you a long distance. If you go too slow, it's going to show you a deep distance usually. That's usually what it does. Hmm, okay. Those are great, great insights. How do you help students who get nervous? Well, I, I believe, you know, I, there's um, sports psychology is a really good thing for a lot of people to use. You know, um, I remember when Liza Tao was a young girl and um, she would work with a lady named Margie Sugarman, which is still around. I recommend some people to call her. And she would get nervous about the crowds, not about riding, but about the crowds. And I remember her seeing they're going, people are trees, people are trees, people are trees. And she'd imagine in her mind that people were trees. So there's so many type of exercises you can learn to do, breathing exercises, talking your way through it. Um, some, some of my riders, they can't watch too many go or they start seeing what's going wrong and they actually in their own, they, they actually create the same problem. Um, mm. They've got to watch some go and then they need to go ahead and take a little walk. Um, I've had some that wear pods and they listen to music and they meditate, everything just to get, get out of their own heads. Yeah, that's, that's usually the hardest place to be. <laughs> it sure is. It sure is. Nerves are the biggest the biggest thing that gets you. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, I guess this might be similar to what you, you were just talking about, but do you have a routine for your students before a competition or a big competition, you know, things that you like them to do? Well, basic. I, I, I think treat yourself like an athlete. You need to, first of all, get to bed early. And you need to eat properly. Um, the hardest things with these, a lot of the young riders nowadays, they don't want to eat breakfast. And they, they say they can't eat before they ride. And I mean, that really affects them, especially the kids with multiple horses. You've got to take care of yourself like an athlete and you've got to make sure you have proper nutrition, nutrition, proper rest and be ready for the um, the event. I always say um, 
It's the five P's. Proper planning prevents poor performance. Um, you've got to plan for it. it it's not, um, and that's planning is taking care of your horse and yourself and taking care of all the things that you need to take care of to be ready for the event. Right. It's great advice. Um, I guess, you know, just a couple of questions to wrap it up. Um, congratulations for being inducted into the 2023 National Show Hunter Hall of Fame. That was well, exciting. Thank you very much. That was very yeah. exciting. Yeah. How, how did it feel? Well, that was an amazing feeling because um, you're voted on, on by your peers. And um, I've always been one as a child. I basically I watched everybody that I saw that did well. I'd watch them and even the people that didn't do well. And I'd try to learn from what they did right and what they did wrong. Um, I was always a very visual person. So um, and when I'd go to a horse show and I'd watch somebody do a certain exercise, I'd take that exercise. I'd go ask them about it. I'd um, ask them how it was set, how many feet. And I'd take that same exercise home and I'd practice with it and see what it did with my horses or a certain horse or um and so all the people that have been inducted in the show hall of fame are people that through the years I've looked up to. So it was really to be in the, a group of those people really was a special feeling. What do you like about equestrian sport? As you said, you've been doing it for so long. What's kept you involved and what, what benefits do you think it has? Well, I think that I think that um, when it really gets down to the nitty gritty, you're basically developing animals and people and you're trying to make them be the best they can be and the life lessons that this sport takes with you that you take with with you from it is amazing i mean first of all hard work is crucial um you don't succeed without hard work and dedication um and you'll see all the top people that have been the top for years so there's some of the hardest workers you'll ever meet and um life's not always fair and um, sometimes it's hard to accept other people's opinions of your performance at the moment, but that's part of it. And um, I think that it's a little bit why a lot of people go into the jumpers because they don't like the subjective part of the hunters and the equitation. But um, I think you've got to take that all for what it's worth and learn to have your own inner feelings about how your ride went. And I've won many classes. I wasn't pleased with my performance and I've lost classes that I was very pleased with my performance. So I think you've got to keep, keep in mind that it's all about the development and the process and not get too wrapped up in all the others. I mean, we all are out there trying to beat each other every day and everybody wants to be the winner at the moment, but sometimes you're learning a little more from the day you lost and the day you won. So you just got to take both of it and you got to um, go with it. And you've got to think that with the young riders you're working with, that you're, they're taking something with them that teaches them about life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's, that's a really, really good advice. Cause it, um, you know, it, it sounds so trite, but like life isn't fair. And, and it, I don't even mean that in a negative way. It's just, um, you know, there's, there's, there could be a lot of hard things or things that you wish had gone a different way. And, and horses really do uh, help you learn that. Well, you're dealing with a living creature that has its own mind and its own opinion and trying to get them to, um, you know, work, to, working together. There's so many factors. You're dealing with an animal that you're riding. You're dealing with your own um, positives and negatives and you're dealing with somebody that's holding the card um, that you've got to deal with them and they're taking what they know with them at that moment and you just got to kind of accept the accept what you get out of it yeah yeah um, last question I, I like to ask people this but what what advice would you have given or would, what advice would you give your younger self um that's a really good question um i would think that um you just oh that's a good question what advice <laughs> would i give my younger self to not take things personally 
Mm. I think that would be the, to believe in what I'm doing and not take things personally. Um, you know, when you're doing this and you're bringing riders along, you know, there, I'm, there comes a time that they have to move on and do something different or they have, they, they have different plans or different avenue and you can't take it personal. You've got to enjoy the process you've had. When a horse doesn't work out, you can't take it personally. If the judging goes, doesn't go the way you wished it would have, you can't take it personally. I, I used to take everything very personal. And now mm -hmm. I really try to keep the personal feelings out of it. Take a deep breath. Think about it. Not re and not be reactive, you know, not be reactive at the moment. Um, I think that they're scoring a lot of the classes nowadays on a day to day basis. And I think it's very hard when you're hearing your score immediately. As much as I like it, sometimes when you're hearing your score immediately, it can hit you the wrong way. And you're best mm -hmm. to just kind of take a pause, maybe go watch the videos. And videos lie. You have to understand that videos lie because they don't always look the same from where the video camera is and where the judge is judging. And um, things look a lot smoother in video. And so many horse shows we go to now, you see the videos and you see the scores. And you can watch around and you can go, wait a minute, that got an 87 and I got an 85. And they were deep over there. Well, in that video, maybe they were a little deep, but from the judge's approach, they weren't. And so that's a little bit of the luck of the draw. Um, you, your course, in your video, you might have looked great, but you, you well know that you made a little mistake somewhere else that didn't show up on the video. So you've got to take all that into consideration. I think that's what, you can't be reactive and you can't take it personal. Well, it has been um, a great conversation. Um, I really appreciate your, your spending so much time with us. And, and uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Sandy. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this week's conversation with Bill Schaub. And a big thank you to the episode's sponsor, U.S. Rider, and its new U.S. Rider app, available from the Apple and Google Play app stores today. You can subscribe to the Practical Horseman podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. While you're there, please rate and review the show. Also, tune into our mini-sode series, The Fod Pod, where you'll hear audio lessons from our favorite Practical Horseman on-demand clips. When you tune into The Fod Pod, listen close for a promo code for 15% off your Practical Horseman on-demand subscription. Thanks again for joining us. I'm Sandy Olenek, and you've been listening to the Practical Horseman Podcast.